Well, let's take our Bibles and look once again in Job chapter 9. Last time I was preaching in Job and looked at the afflictions that the Lord brings on his children for his purpose and glory. But we'll look at a couple other portions of scripture here in Job. My purpose is not to preach through these books, but to highlight different scriptures that pertain to God and his glory and redemption, salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been some time now going through different portions of the Old Testament that clearly set Christ forth in his glorious person and work accomplished. But here in Job chapter 9 is a very important question that many in our generation don't even consider. And yet... It is an important question, more important than what most people are asking about end times or Sabbath days or what you can do or can't do, assuming that they're God's children. And so they talk about and think about other things. But here, Job, which was one of the oldest writers that we have in Scripture, he lived even before Abraham and Moses. And here we have this question in verse 2, which is the base of this particular message that we're looking at today. And that is, how can man be just with God? There's the question. How can man be just with God? It says here in Job 1 and 2, then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? This question here is asked over and over by Job and his friends. Not only here in Job chapter 9, in verse 2, but when you go over to Job chapter 15. See, they're sitting watching Job in a very desperate state, so grave that he's sitting on a garbage heap, scraping his sores with pot shirts. Such was the humiliation to which the Lord had brought him. And now they're trying to counsel him as his friends, and they're trying to figure out well, what did you do, Job? What sin did you commit that now you're in this particular state? And we know how people are. If you're going through some particular trials, people will try to analyze you and try to get you to be introspective and see what there is in your life that may not be right and to get right with God. But here's a good question. How can a man or sinner be right with God, be just with God? Here in Job chapter 15, in verse 14, we read, What is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. There's another important question that needs to be asked in our generation. When people are talking about all of their devotions and things to do to be right with God, well, what is there in man that could ever be said to be clean or notice that which is born of a woman? So when we say, how can man be just with God? It's any creature that comes forth from the womb. How is it that any should be called righteous. And then, of course, over in Job chapter 25, every one of these could be a message in and of themselves, but asking the same question again in verse 4. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born 
of a woman. Would that the Lord would cause us to reflect upon this because it's the most important question that could ever be asked. A lot of people asking questions about whether we're in the last days or questions about the second coming and all of these things, but a person can dwell on all those things and still miss the most vital question of all, and that is what it is to be just before God. It's not what takes place in the second coming. The Lord has already purposed that to his glory, but what took place in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the vital question. But in order to answer this question of how can man be just with God, there are three particular aspects that need to be considered. The first is what it is to be holy and just before God. So we have to deal with God's holiness. Second, what is man? So we have to consider who is man as a sinner. And then comes the question, what is it to be just or justified before God? So a very simple outline for us to look at this particular portion of scripture here in Job chapter 9. The first point is, when we talk about being just with God, what is God's chief attribute? I know we're not to emphasize any one over another, but all of his attributes, what characterizes God, is summed up in his holiness. A lot of people today want to talk about the love of God, but in order for God to demonstrate his love toward a sinner, his holiness must be answered. He can't just love a sinner. He cannot consider a sinner apart from his holiness. And so if there's one particular word used to describe our God, it is that word, holy. And here's where people in their ignorance talk about a loving God and imagine that he loves everybody without exception. Well, the love of God is without distinction. In other words, he doesn't favor one sinner over another in preference by distinction, but his love is not without exception because the scriptures are clear that there are those that God hates and there is a judgment in a hell that God has prepared for sinners that he condemns. And you say, well, how could God create sinners or men and women just to cast them into hell? The answer is a holy God. And even as I speak with you about God's holiness, I have to confess that it is beyond what I can even describe or think because I'm a sinner and so even in my depravity any definition of holiness that I might give is going to be tainted I know illustrations in scripture and we can describe God's holiness by his act here or his act there that shows that he's holy but to truly know God in all his holiness Apart from a mediator, there's none that can see God and live, such as his holiness. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see in Isaiah's vision of the Lord, high and lifted up. Isaiah 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And what did they cry? Verse 3. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. To speak of God's holiness is to speak of his glory. And so holy and reverent is his name. This is the chief attribute 
of God that we find throughout Scripture, which must be answered. And this is why the question is asked, how can man be just with God? What kind of God? A holy God. Unless we have a holiness and we have a righteousness that answers to God's holiness and righteousness, then we can never enter into his presence, can never hope to be in his presence. So everything about God has to do with him as holy. The scriptures use that term holy, which means without sin, no taint of darkness, of shadow of darkness at all in him. We read of holy angels that God has created, and yet those angels are not even to be compared to God's holiness. We read of his Holy Spirit in the tabernacle. His presence was manifested in the Holy of Holies. And even on the mitre of the high priest, these words were written, holiness to the Lord. And as it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Now, when people hear that, what do they do? Well, they think, all right, I got to get busy and getting holy. I made my profession and now I've got the spirit. And so in cooperation with the spirit, I'm going to start living in such a way as I sin less and less. Well, I will tell you this, holiness has no degrees. You're either holy or you're not. And so if you're thinking that somehow you're going to progress in holiness, that by degrees you're going to attain unto hope, that's not holiness. That's a lie. But there are many that believe that. They think that they're working out this holiness because they read those words and they think, oh, without holiness no man shall see the Lord, so I need to get busy. But such thinking is faith. I'll tell you this. Without a holiness, again, that answers to the very holiness of God, there's no hope for any of us. And so when God manifests, even when he manifests his grace or his mercy or love, he doesn't set aside his holiness to do so. It's not as if, okay, since man can't answer my holiness, I'll still be gracious or I'll still be merciful, I'll still love. No. I've used before that illustration of a wheel with a hub. The problem today is people want to make God's love to be the chief attribute. And so they put that as the hub, and then you see the spokes that come out from there. And you can explain God's love, a grace through love, you can explain his mercy through love, but how do you explain his wrath? See, that's what People stop and think, and all of a sudden, the spoke is broken. They don't know how to answer that. How could God be love and still be a wrathful God? Well, it's because their concept of God is false from the beginning. This is why it takes God by his spirit revealing himself in us to know him as he is in truth. But the chief attribute is his holiness and his justice. Take that and put that as the hub. Again, using the illustration of the wheel. And then you can understand God's grace in light of his holiness. You can understand his love. He's loving, but not at the expense of his holiness. And when you put God's wrath and justice there, you understand how it is that God can be a wrathful God and a just God to condemn sinners because he is holy. And it answers every one of his attributes, his truth, his holiness. And so this is why we need to consider who he is. God is holy. Now there, like I said, there are many illustrations we could use that describe God's holiness that we see in scripture. You can go all the way back to the garden in the fall. What was it that caused Adam to be cast out of the garden with Eve and an angel put there at the entrance with a flaming sword to keep them from entering back in? Well, that's God's holiness. And what was it that caused Uzzah 
to be smitten dead when David was carrying that ark on an ox cart rather than on the shoulders of the priest. And he reached out to stabilize the ark with good intention. And yet God smote him dead. That's God's holiness. Why is it in the scriptures that we just read here in Isaiah that the seraphim, the very angels, we're talking about these elect angels that never fell, that are called the holy angels. How is it that even they cover their faces before this holy God? Or even Isaiah, there in Isaiah 6, when the Lord was pleased to reveal himself in his holiness, he cried out, I am cut off. Woe is me, I am undone. That's what that word means, to be cut off. But I'll tell you, you can talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, you can talk about God having destroyed the world, many illustrations of God's holiness. But for me, there's no greater description of God's holiness than what he did to his beloved son. If you want to know just how holy God is and how it is that he must answer that righteousness and that holiness to ever save a sinner, Look what he did to his son. He spared not his son, but delivered him up that he might freely give life unto all those that he purposed to save. That's a picture of God's holiness, the darkness that occurred on that day when Christ hung on the cross and he bore the sins of his people. That's how holy God is. It required a just satisfaction in order for God to be just and justified. So that's the very first thing that must be considered to answer this question of how can man be just with God? Just how holy is God? He's so holy that unless the sinner is given, and that by imputation, by the work of another, by, by the substitute, just like with Adam and Eve, God took off those fig leaves. That was no answer to his holiness, but it required the death of those animals that had not done any sin. They were sinless, and yet God slew them and then took those skins and clothed Adam and Eve. That was representative of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ had to come and earn and establish in his life that righteousness that God required, not only in word and deed, but in thought. A lot of people mostly think, well, I'm doing pretty good keeping the commandments. How's that working when it comes down to your very thoughts? Even thinking that you're doing pretty good is evil and a lie. And yet, even if you were to say, well, I'm doing pretty good on this one and that one, and I'm minding my words. <laughs> it's like a kid that has uh, gotten himself all dirty, and now he's trying to wash himself up with some water, some soap, and all he's doing is spread the dirt around. That's all we are. But what of the thoughts? The Lord Jesus Christ in coming, in order to satisfy God's law and justice, had to obey that law, not only in word and deed, but spirit, thought. And that's where he questioned those Pharisees that were boasting in their keeping of the law, where he got right down to the thoughts. You've heard that it said that a man should not commit adultery, but if a man so much as look on a woman and lust after her in his heart, he's committed adultery. But here our Lord Jesus Christ in coming, that's why he came. It was required that he answer this law and justice of God, his very holiness, to where God would be satisfied in his work on behalf of his people. But secondly, in answering this question, how can man be just with God? It points out just how sinful man is. Just as we don't understand or can't enter into what it is for God to be holy, I dare say we can't even begin to enter in 
to just how sinful we are. What is it to be a sinner? Here again, people think, well, I did this sin, or I did, they, they describe or define themselves by their acts, but we don't describe, we're not sinners because we sin, we sin because we're sinners. And this is the effect of the fall. When the Lord first created Adam, he created him upright. And some would say, well, he made him righteous. No, because righteousness doesn't change. He put him in a state I would describe as of innocence. In other words, at that particular time, he did not know sin. But God made Adam to be fallible. And that's why he fell. He was created in that upright state, but it was only a matter of time. And here's where people say, well, if God gives man a choice, then that's the way it ought to be. Well, Adam was put in that state whereby the Lord gave him that choice, if you will, to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but to eat only of the, the tree of life. And what did he do? He fell. Even in his best state, his will was made to be a fallen will. And so we have the rest today of the story, as they say. He became a sinner through the fall. And uh, through him, all of his descendants became sinners through the fall. That's why we read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That all have sinned can be translated all did sin. And ever since then, man, every baby that's born in this world is born a sinner. It's not as if each child born now comes in with a clean slate. This is what some teach is that up to a certain age, a child has a clean slate and it depends on how you write on that slate, but then eventually they get to an age of accountability where now they are accountable for their sin. No, scriptures are very clear that we're born in sin. This is just how sinful sin is. If you look with me, in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 5, it says here, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. That word shapen goes all the way back to conception. We're not even talking about being born yet, but when uh, that seed is joined to the egg in the womb and conception occurs, According to God's direction. That's the word there. I was shapen in iniquity. And it says, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So what was shaped in iniquity, when it brings forth that fruit, comes into life, being born, what's born but a sinner. I know we look at little babies and we goo goo ga ga all over them and oh how cute, but I'll tell you, we're staring in the face of a sinner. Also in Psalm 58 and verse 3, we have this description. So just as the scriptures are replete with descriptions of God's holiness and who he is as God, we have to say just as much that the scriptures describe man as nothing but a sinner. So that's why the question is important. How can man, sinful man, be just with a holy God? All right, here in Psalm 58, in verse 3, it says, The wicked are estranged not from the age of accountability. Notice, the wicked are estranged from the womb. 
And it says they go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. That's not something that people want to hear about today. They think that people are born innocent and then at a certain time they go astray. No, here it says they go astray as soon as they be born. In fact, they're estranged, notice, from the womb. They're again from conception. And what does it mean, therefore, to be a sinner? It means that as sinful flesh, none of us is capable of any good before God. You hear talk about man's so-called free will. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing. Man's will is bound. It's, it's just as bound as if you were to take a tennis ball and turn it loose. People say, well, God ought to give man a choice. All right. So God takes his hand off a of man. What, what does a tennis ball do? Does it stay there? Does it go up? No, it drops. Someone described it as the gravity of depravity. I like that term. But here in Jeremiah chapter 13, and there are a number of scriptures we could consider together, but how sinful are we? I won't just say how sinful is man. How sinful are we? Anyone that's been born of a woman, it says here in verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin? See, people say, well, I've got free will to decide whether I want to or not. Try changing your skin. Try willing your skin to be a different color without using any products. Or a leopard, his spots. Can a leopard self-determine to somehow grow stripes like a zebra? Can a leopard change his spots? then may ye also do good. If that were possible, then may ye also do good that are what? Accustomed to do evil. That right there completely slays any concept at all of thinking that somehow man has the will to change. So corrupt is our sinfulness that there is no ability in this flesh with which to Please God. In fact, a little further on in Jeremiah chapter 17, it says there in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When you find people that say, well, I know my heart and I know my thoughts. Well, if you did, all you would find would be sinfulness. In fact, you know, again, we fall in this trap of thinking, well, things are getting worse and worse. We hear that all the time. No, they've been bad since the fall. Even back in Noah's day, if you look in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, look how the Lord described man back in that day, and that's many thousands of years ago. It's just that perhaps with technology and other things that appears that the world is getting worse with 24-7 news, etc. But look what the scriptures describe here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, this is what it is to be sinful, to be a sinner. In fact, over in Psalm chapter 14, again, we're just touching on certain scriptures that describe man as he is. Here in verses 1 to 3, the fool has said in his heart, you notice there is an, is an italic. So if you just read it without the italic, no God. In other words, that's the rebellion of the heart in answer to who God is and his glory and truth. In every case, apart from the work of the spirit, we would rebel, such as the state of the heart. And here's why, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any 
that did understand and seek God. Well, we live in a generation where people are religious and zealous. They seek a God. They seek the God of their imagination, but none could seek God in truth apart from God doing a work of grace. It says they are all gone aside and they're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And it's this very scripture then that Paul takes and the Lord directed him to write there in Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 through 19. How, how sinful are we? Well, the scriptures declare that we're dead. A dead body has no will, no decision, no thought. See, that's how we are, dead in our sins without hope and without God in this world. That's what we are as we're born in this world. And what's the greatest evidence of this depravity? You think, well, it's like going out there and murdering somebody or committing adultery. I'll tell you the greatest evidence of depravity is when men seek to justify themselves before God. And I'll tell you, that's this world of religion. Men going about to justify themselves before God. Or they'll compare themselves with one another. As if that's the standard. Without any thought of who God is in their holiness. But that's why God gave the law. If you look over in Romans chapter 3. See, people today think that God gave the law for us to earn our salvation. No. There again, the blindness of the heart that causes men not to see that everything that God gave by way of the law was to condemn. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 19, it says, Now we know, I love those expressions, who knows? Those who have been taught of God know that what things soever the law said, that said to them who are under the law, that what? Every mouth may be stopped. How do you know the Lord has done a work of grace when the mouth is stopped? You stop making excuses. You stop justifying yourself. You stop thinking that somehow you've got some holiness or righteousness to offer unto God. The mouth is stopped and all the world becomes guilty before God. Because it says, verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's why God gave the law. It wasn't a means of salvation but that every mouth might be stopped. So this brings us now to the third aspect of this question, how can man be just with God? And the answer is that man must be justified by God. It's not within us. So in order for a man to be just with God, it must be God himself that declares that sinner to be righteous. But to do that, it has to be in a way that answers to God's holiness and justice himself. When we talk about what a man, how can a man be just with God, that word just is to be without sin and to be without blame or to be without guilt. Well, if that had anything to do with me, then I could never be just with God. And yet we read in the scriptures of sinners that God has justified and purposed to present to himself holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Here are some examples. For example, look in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22. This is the work of God's grace. And this is what the Spirit of God teaches those that God has purposed to save. They learn that any righteousness or holiness must come from God himself who is righteous and holy. Now here in Colossians chapter 1, 
Notice in verse 20, speaking of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and having made peace out through the blood of his cross. For God to make peace with the sinner is not God lowering his standard in any way. It required nothing less. And again, it comes back to just how holy God is and just how sinful we are as sinners. It required nothing less than the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The wage of sin is death. And here, nothing less than the blood of his cross. No more despicable way for one to die than the cross. But it says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There can be no reconciliation. And that term reconciliation then presumes that there's a separation. And there is. Such as our sin, such as God's holiness. But where is reconciliation? When Job asks the question, how can man be just with God? How can man be reconciled with God? Well, it says in verse 21, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. There's so many today that are still enemies and at enmity with God by their works. When it's called wicked works, it doesn't mean they're out there robbing banks or living in an evil way. We're talking about a religious generation whose works are described as wicked works because none of that can satisfy a holy God. But now he hath reconciled. How? In the body of his flesh through death. Most people describe their salvation as in terms of having made a decision. That's not how God reconciles sinners to himself. If any were reconciled, they were reconciled there at the cross. And here's the purpose of his death. Notice verse 22, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I know that some like to describe justification with the expression, just as if I had never sinned. But it's not just as if I had never sinned. It's just as if I had always obeyed. Such is the justification of God. Such is the reconciliation by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That those sinners for whom Christ paid that debt, not only is the sin put away, but there is given a righteousness that is answers to God's very righteousness and holiness. So that when God looks upon those sinners for whom Christ died, he sees nothing but righteousness and holiness. That's an amazing thing. That's why it says here, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. That's how we're born still in this world. In our minds, in our thoughts alienated. But oh, the wonder when the Lord is pleased by his spirit to teach those for whom Christ paid the debt, that their debt was not only paid when Christ died, but it was there that they were justified before a holy God, declared righteous. It doesn't mean to be made holy in our being because we know ourselves still to be sinners, but that that very righteousness of Christ was put to the account of his people. Christ's death did not just cover the sins of his people. Some people refer to Christ's death as an atonement. That's an Old Testament word. The blood of bulls and goats was an atonement, a covering in God's forbearance until Christ should come and put away the sin and declare righteous those sinners, even in the Old Testament that he purposed to save. But Christ's death is a reconciliation. It is a propitiation, that is a satisfaction to God's holiness. It is a redemption. That's why when people say, well, I still believe Christ died for every sinner in the world. You mean he redeemed every sinner in the world? You mean he reconciled every sinner? You mean he justified every sinner? 
If he did, then there's no more condemnation. That's what the scriptures say. That's how we know that it wasn't for everybody. God sent his son to lay down his life for all sinners without distinction is the way to look at it. Not without exception, without distinction. Without distinction means he didn't consider whether this one or that one was more worthy or not. He's no respecter of persons. And the scriptures use that word all. He gave his life a ransom for all. It's not talking about everybody, but it's talking about all kinds of sinners. And boy, we see that, don't we? When you look around and consider those that God has been pleased to save, like ourselves, we marvel how it is that he can be merciful to sinners such as we are. Well, that's how man can be just with God. He must be justified by God. And how is he justified? How is it that he's brought to have that perfect peace with God? Because that's what it is to be justified in Romans chapter 5. In verse 1, we see that. Notice, therefore, being justified. Well, what does the therefore go back to? Verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That word for means because of. So that means that when Christ died for his people, he died for them as sinners. But when he raised again, it was because of their justification. That's what his death accomplished. People today put justification at the point when a sinner believed. That's, that's not when sinners were justified. They were justified at the cross. And if any are brought to believe, it's because they were already justified. That's an amazing truth to ponder, that when I was born in this world as one of God's elect, that I was already born justified, not because I was elect, but because Christ died. Therein is my justification. And therefore, it was necessary that the Spirit draw me because Christ said, of all the fathers give me, I'll not lose one. And notice here, therefore, being justified. Now, there were no punctuation marks in the original text. The editors here, in many translations, they put a comma after faith, but really the comma should be after justified, therefore being justified based upon Christ's death, by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, as he grants that faith, we enter into this peace with God in our spirits and hearts reconciled to him because of already been, having been justified. That's that peace with God, that reconciliation with God that he caused us to enter in and enjoy. And secondly, to be justified is to be free from the curse of the law, really from all charges over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. That's what we read here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. It is God that declares righteous. Who is he that condemned? But it is Christ that died. He doesn't say anything there about my believing and therefore I'm justified. Now, who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died. He rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Oh, what a beautiful truth we find here in answer to that question. How can man be just with God? has to be in accord with his holiness. And it has to be in a way that answers to our sinfulness without God ever diminishing his holiness. And that answer then is only in by and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Even Job was given that faith to look to Christ where he declared, I know that my Redeemer lives and in that day shall stand. What day was he looking to? The day when Christ would come and pay his sin debt, just like all those of the Old Testament. Therein is the sinner's justification before God. Amen.